Welcome. We've been doing these classes now for the last year and a half. My name is Holiday Tyson, and um, I've been a midwife and also a nurse educator for the past 30 years, 32 years. And I just recently, this past year, retired from clinical practice as a midwife um, and really wanted to devote much more of my time to education. And partly it's because I feel that so much education, especially for parents, is not that well done. Over the years as a midwife and in other capacities, I would hear people say, oh, we went to the classes, but they really weren't that useful. I mean, this was useful or that. So my goal is really to take 30 years of going to births in seven different countries and working all around Canada and with different midwifery groups and with lots of different people and try to share information for you that's gonna be useful in practical ways. Like I really want you to leave tonight feeling, okay, that makes sense or that will be helpful to me. And the most important thing is that after your birth in the first couple of weeks, I want you to be able to think, okay, that was helpful, all right? So that's the feedback that I, I need to make sure you give the midwives what was useful, if anything wasn't useful. Um, and that's really all I care about is that it's really useful to you. We're going to today go through, it's an intensive really, we're going to start with late labor or late pregnancy rather. We're going to go through understanding what that's all about, some of the common complaints and worries, um, good ways to get ready for labor. Then we're going to look at labor and birth itself. Um, and then usually we take a little bit of a break once the baby's just born. <laughs> and then, so I get to loosen up, go get a drink or something. And um, then afterwards, we're going to look at the first few moments after a birth, the first hour, the first day, and the first week. Really, there's very special, important things that happen in all those times. And you can probably be helped a lot by, by thinking about that tonight. At any point, you can just stop and shout out a question. Um, always, just, just interrupt me anytime you want. Also, at the end, people can ask questions. And if you have a question that you really would prefer to just ask without other people hearing, I always am here in the break and also afterwards to answer anything that, that you might have. And afterwards, if you go home and think, oh, but what about this? Obviously, ask your midwives, right? Or can I just check, is everybody here uh, working with midwives? Yeah, nobody. Last class, there were a few people who weren't. So everyone's working with midwives. So obviously, ask your midwives. Then the other thing is, if there's something else that you're just curious about, just tell them and to say, is it OK if I, if I email Holiday? And you can also email me. So I'll give you some. Uh, I'm happy to just follow up, be useful. Here's, there's four themes, really, that go through what I've been doing with these intensives for people. Um, and I want you to understand that before we get into the, um, you know, the actual meat of it. The first one is that sometimes people think that when they're giving birth, they're really just giving birth to a baby. You know, that's what everyone's focused on is the birth itself and the baby and the care of the baby. But it's really worth stopping to remember that you're not just giving birth to a baby. You're actually giving birth to parents, okay? You're developing becoming parents. And probably most of us think becoming parents is the most important thing we do in our whole lives. But we don't spend that much time thinking about the importance of the way that we do that and the way that we are to each other in that. So if you are in partner, how many, is everybody here, how many people are in partnered relationships here? There, is there anybody here who's solo? Like, and, you know, just there's special, special helpful things for people who are solo or have maybe their mother as a, as a main support. But I want to tell you about this research. There's this great research that looked at how happy people were a year, two years, and five years after their birth and how they felt about their partners and how they felt about their birth and how confident they were. And they thought when they did this that people who had easy births and normal births would be the people who were happiest. But what they found was that it had almost nothing to do with that. It had to do with how people felt their partners were with them. Not about expertise, but whether they were there for them and they were really a team. Okay? So one of the things I try to really help people do is to figure out how to work really well together because that's the thing you're going to remember more than anything. Your midwife or doctor, nurse, anyone who's in the room, they're just really at the end of the day, they're just there to help you for a day. You're taking the baby home. You're the people who are developing as parents. And, and it's the way you are with each other that really matters. So that's one of the themes. The next one is that in the age of the internet, everybody is overloaded with information. You can go every day on the internet and find a ton of information. But you see a correlation between that and a lot of fear. 
a lot of people are more fearful now in childbirth, even though childbirth is safer than it's ever been. A lot of people are very fearful about it. They're very fearful about what they do with their baby. Can I sleep the baby on the side for 10 minutes? Oh no, will the baby be okay? What if I don't fully breastfed? Will the baby be okay? What if I do attachment parenting or don't do attachment parenting? There's just an enormous amount of fear so one of the things I want to do today is give you information that helps you feel calmer, <laughs> that just helps you feel like, oh, that's something I can use. That's really practical. Um, and then oh, the, the way that we do that is I try to give you some knowledge of physiology that you don't usually easily get in your sources. Because if you can understand what's exactly happening and the mechanics of it, then actually now you can see what are the things that you have control over, what are the things that you have no control over, and what are the things that you have a little control over. And if you can leave tonight having a sense of those, I guarantee you're going to probably have a smoother time in labor and, the, and birth in the first week or so. It's, that's information most people don't have a sense of. The last thing has to do with men. You know, one of the things I've seen in the last 30 years is that we haven't treated men around childbirth very well. Up until recently, we didn't even let them into births. And then about 25, 30 years ago, we started letting them in. But we've never really stopped not taking them seriously. You know, you can still, on a regular basis in a labor and delivery unit, hear people joking, well, if men had to get pregnant, there wouldn't be any babies. When we stop to think about that, it's a crazy, crazy thing to say. I think I've hardly ever met a partner, a man who wouldn't have gladly stood in for their partner at the time of labor and birth. Or people make jokes about them fainting. Or people make jokes about whether they're a good coach or not. And we forget that it's their baby too, and that they've never been to a birth before. And yet, somehow, we expect them to be you know, excellent coaches. So one of the things is to figure out between the two of you what kind of sharing and helping you want to do when it comes to the labor and the birth? Because people are really different, and there's no one right way to do it. And secondly, I want to give you some tools that you can practice so that you're going to be a lot better at it. Because a lot of labor support stuff is not that hard. It's just hard to do it for the first time when someone's in pain. Okay, a common scenario you see with women in labor is someone will be like, oh, they're in, t they're in pain, they're in pain, and then their partner says, oh, okay, I'll try to put my hand there, and then she goes, no, no, not there. And then someone expert comes along, does it, and then the guy feels, well, okay, well, I guess I'm not good at that. But the truth is, if you find a few of those, if you learn a few of those maneuvers and you practice them, actually, you will be really good at it. And that's a, that's a pretty fun and fabulous thing. So we're going to do some of that. Uh, we'll do some of that tonight, too. And I guess I just have to say that I'm a little, not in awe, but I've been so impressed in the last 30 years just to see how much parenting has changed and improved and how big a role fathers have taken. And I think that we need to include talking to them a lot more respectfully and include them in things more than, more than we have. So let's start with uh, late pregnancy. Most of you are in late pregnancy now. And people think of it as a state of waiting, right? You're waiting, and then at some point, labor is going to happen, right? Like it's a distinct thing. We're waiting, we're waiting. Everybody asks you, is it happening yet? Is it on? Has anything happened? But it's really helpful to understand that really, the last couple months of pregnancy is a gradual transition into labor. And if you understand that, and you understand physiologically what's happened, Sometimes you can have some effects on making it go more smoothly for you and feel more confident and calm. So let me start by telling you a little bit of uh, anatomy and physiology that can be helpful. So here's a pelvis in front of you, right? You, everybody recognizes that. People tend to think it sits like that, but it doesn't. It sits like this, right? Here are your hip bones at the front, right? So here people are. And actually, pelvises aren't all the same. There's actually like four different kinds of pelvises, and there's also some mixed pelvises, right? So for example, some people have pelvises called platyploid pelvises. For example, most Asian women tend to have pelvises that are bigger here, side to side, than front to back. So when they give birth, babies tend to go through like this, kind of shimmying their head down, OK? Some people have something called anthropoid pelvises, which have larger diamond shapes, and they're bigger front to back than they are side to side. And depending on the size of the baby, sometimes those babies just kind of shoot through like little divers, 
right? And so, you know when you hear those stories about people who say, I don't know, it was 39 weeks pregnant, nothing had happened, I got up to brush my teeth one morning and suddenly my waters broke and then suddenly, uh, and I was pushing and the baby just flew out. And you think, how, how can that happen? That almost always is, is, is because it's an anthropoid pelvis. Almost always, OK? Because the structure of the pelvis facilitates, if the baby is about the right size and position, facilitates a really fast sort of exit without a lot of turning around. But most people are going to experience a kind of a, a what I call like a three-point turn when babies come down. So we've got babies are coming down. Let's assume your baby's head first, because that's sort of easiest. So they come down. And then they meet the pelvic floor here. And these bones, they turn around like this, right? Then they come out. Then they have to turn for the shoulders. And then they come out, OK? And not too many of them just fly out when you're brushing your teeth, OK? And it's the strangest thing that the thing most people are afraid of is that their baby would fly out when they're brushing their teeth. But if that happened, could you imagine how easy it would be for everybody? We wouldn't need any health professionals. We wouldn't need anything. So it's funny that that always makes the news. The person who has the, the ultra, uber, easy, fast birth makes the news. But actually, it's just a completely normal, completely normal function that most of us aren't quite, you know, quite lucky enough to have. So, when you look, before I draw the uterus next, when you look at this pelvis, see they've got little screws here? It's to demonstrate the fact that the pelvis becomes quite unstable, unstable when you're pregnant. So normally your pelvis is kind of like this, and it doesn't move around much. You're walking, it's like this, okay? Then what happens is when you're pregnant, you have these hormones, progesterone and estrogen, that run through your body. And they're set up to help you get ready for birth. OK? And you have a lot of them, especially in the last month of pregnancy. Have you ever found yourself going to get into a car and you feel like you left the rest of your pelvis behind? Does anyone have that? Have you had that experience? Yeah? Well, that's because, see here, see here, here, all of these are unstable, right? And that's good because it gives you a lot of room for the head to come down and to give birth. But it can be uncomfortable if you're trying to pivot, climb stairs quickly, you know, change, suddenly leap or lunge like that, OK? So some people are different than others. Some people tend to have kind of tight ligaments, and some people have looser ones. And that's important to know. You can't really control that. Have you ever noticed some people, if they carry really heavy grocery bags, afterwards they'll say, oh, that feels bad. It feels like everything's almost separated. But other people are like this. Well, it's the same with your pelvis, OK? So everybody's pelvis will open in pregnancy because of the effects of hormones but it'll be different between different people. So some people, when they walk, literally feel like they've got three pelvises. And other people don't really notice all that much. Okay? Now, the way you can use this information is to see that there are certain positions that allow you to open the pelvis up more. Okay? So you can imagine, if your legs are down here, that if you bend down and squat, for example, you tend to open up the pelvis. Even, in fact, when people lean over a surface like this, a desk, what happens is they open up this at the back. And that can give your baby about another centimeter, two centimeters of room. OK? So the first practical lessons are, for pelvises, you want to be careful if they feel unstable that you don't pull anything by suddenly deciding to run hurdles or, you know, do lunges. Late pregnancy is not the best time for that, for most people anyway. But you can use the fact that your pelvis is less stable to make more room for the baby and to help it go down on the cervix. And the ways you do that are pretty simple. One of the ways is that every single day you spend some time like this, okay? It's just kind of like... I call this like the bashful elephant maneuver, you know? Just go like this. It's really simple. And even if you're a person who has any health problems, you can do that safely. And what that will do is open up these areas at the back of the pelvis and help the baby to go down, OK? So people will talk about gravity. But just standing here like that, you don't really get any great effects of gravity. You have to help it a little bit with positions. OK? So that's, the that's really the first lesson about pelvises. So squatting is a good one. 
but a lot of people aren't comfortable squatting. If you've already been squatting, it'll be great for you, but don't decide to try to start to squat at 39 weeks if you've never done it before. <laughs> you know, really, it's not gonna be that comfortable or fun, but everybody can do this, okay? Now, there's one other one. Do you ever remember when you were a kid playing with a hula hoop or any of you go to those folk festivals where then adults play with hula hoops too, right? Well, if you just think about the simple maneuver of a hula hoop, and imagine this with the pelvis, okay? If you start moving it around and you do this every day, what you do is you create openings here in the pelvis, okay? So there's actually really good research about this particular maneuver and lots of people do it all the way through labor and they find they get pretty comfortable and the baby's head comes down really well, okay? So that's the pelvis, which basically is just the little bony tunnel that your baby's gonna come through. And the next important part is the uterus. So the uterus is the home for your baby and it starts being only like an upside down pear, about seven centimeters high, five centimeters across at the top. It's little, okay? And then it grows so that it ends up being, oh, at least 30 centimeters high, okay? And there's, okay, and there's the cervix, the little opening that's, that stays closed until labor. Um, and then you've got a few layers. We don't need to talk about, you know, a lot about the muscles, but basically you've got a muscle layer, and then you've got an inside layer, and then you've got a parametrium outside layer. The bottom line is, it's a really big muscle set of muscles, but it's unlike any other muscle in your body. And if you understand how it works, this will help you in labor. This is an area in which you have some control, okay? So you have on the top right-hand side of your uterus something called pacemaker cells. They're up around here, okay? And unlike, most muscles in your body can just do two things. They can contract and they can relax. But the uterus has this amazing ability to contract and then to retract on itself. And that's because it has this job to do. Let's just put a happy little, there's the baby. I'm not a great artist. Okay, and there's the placenta feeding the baby. Okay, right? So as you get closer to term, to 38 weeks, you're going to find that the head stops swimming around up here and it goes down and it rests here on the cervix, okay? It's going to come down here and rest on the cervix. Well, what happens up here is that the uterus has to develop a big pushing wedge that goes like this. And down here, the uterus has to figure out a way to get completely out of the way, okay? So it has to go from being kind of like a doorknob to a finished pancake and then to nothing, okay? Really, it's magical when you think about it. So it does this by this really interesting process of polarity, which is a little bit like push me, pull you. You know that whole thing, push me, pull you? That's what happens, that this pushes down and these pull up, okay? But here's the trick. There's really great research with all mammals, including humans, that when you distract people or you put them in high light environments, right, or you have them talk a lot, a lot of people will not achieve very efficient polarity. And that's why you see people who care, you know, who are trying to facilitate more normal births, you see them going into quieter environments, you see darker lights. It's not just because it's a mood thing that makes people feel better, it's because it's proven to make these better. And partly it's because it facilitates the main hormone, oxytocin, that makes the uterus run. If you have enough oxytocin, your uterus is likely to run well. If you don't have a lot of oxytocin, it won't. In the last 20 years, we've seen a huge upsurge in people having augmented labor with oxytocin that comes chemically through an IV drip because they got a bit stalled. It's a very interesting discussion how much of it, how much is, if we'd waited, just waited, they would have been fine and how much they needed it. But what everybody pretty much agrees is that when people stand around talking, timing, in bright light and people, a lot of people will not have their uteruses functioning as well as they could, all right? So just think ahead that you want to be able to have a quiet environment as much as possible 
You don't want a lot of talking. You don't want to be on your phone all the time, okay? And you want oxytocin, okay? So you've probably, a lot of you read about oxytocin. So do you know the ways in which you create oxytocin? By cuddling with the people you love, by listening to the voices of the people you care about, all of the things that make you feel calm and relaxed. So the primary job, I would say, of a partner, of the family or friends that are supporting someone in labor is to help facilitate that. And in our world, it can be hard because everyone's excited, right? You know you get 50 calls in. Is it happening yet? Is it happening yet? How many centimeters are you, etc.? The problem is that that's not always so helpful for people in their labor. So let me tell you a little bit more about the uterus because it's pretty interesting. And let's focus on the thing everyone's afraid of, which is pain, right? Everyone's like, oh, what's going to happen? Am I going to be one of those people who finds it unbearable or what? You know, you know how there's some people who go to the dentist and they say, I don't know what everyone's talking about. I don't even need freezing, right? And other people who find it really awful to go to the dentist. They just feel like this terrible pain when people poke at their teeth or do anything. Well. When you do little MRIs or even types of x-rays, what you find is that some of them have little nerves in their mouths that are like spaghettini. And other people have like big fat fettuccine ones. And the people who have the big fat fettuccine ones are the people who really feel pain a lot. It's not because they have a bad attitude. It's not because of something else. It's because of that. So here, in this zone, is where you have the majority of nerves. It's called a plexus, which just means a meeting place, like a mall for nerves, OK? And the nerves are here. And in some people, they also extend here to the top of the legs, OK? Some people they do, some people they don't. So here's the part, again, you don't have control over. We don't know whether you're the person that's got the spaghettini nerves, OK, going across there, or whether you're the person who's got more of the fettuccine ones, OK? That you can't change. And that's why it's so important. If you're a person, when you go through labor, who, whether you started by saying, well, I'm open to taking drugs, or I'm really sure I don't want them, if you're a person who does end up having some kind of drugs, whether it's an epidural or something else, because you experienced pain, it's really important to know that that's completely fine. And it doesn't reflect the fact that you didn't perform, you know? Like, there's a lot of expectations that people have if I was just braver, all of that. So just remember, you don't know what your nerves are going to be like, OK? You just don't know in advance. Nobody does. And it's a pretty amazing thing to watch that some people just don't experience it as that painful, and other people experience it as very painful, all right? So here's your uterus fully grown, right? And you don't really tend to have pain in these areas because that's not where the nerves are, OK? You tend to have them down here, some here times here in the legs, and sometimes around the back because that's where all the nerves are, OK? Now, here is where partners come in as the most important people on the planet. And here's what I have to say. I mean, women can do this too, but men tend to have better upper body and hand strength as a general rule. And so with a little practice, they're actually better than anybody else at providing this support. So knowing how the nerves are, I'm going to show you two maneuvers that really are helpful. And if you practice them a little bit in um, late pregnancy, I, I guarantee you're going to find them really helpful in labor itself. Who's fairly pregnant? Can I, can I use you? Is that OK? OK, come here. The first thing I'm going to show you, and then I'm going to get you to up to do it, okay, is something I call a penguin walk, okay? And what we're going to do, remembering that all the nerves are here, right, is what we're going to do is lift the uterus up. And what that should do, aside from being good for you for your circulation, is actually really release any discomfort. And in early labor, sometimes it can actually erase a lot of the pain. And in later labor, it can also help a lot, okay? So what you're going to do with your partner, right, is here, just stand so everyone can see, is you're going to put your hands here, okay? You stand behind them, and then you lift up. And when you do that, it should feel good. How, how does that feel? Yeah, does it, did, does it actually, does it feel good though? Like, does it feel supported? Yeah. Yeah, okay. So look, come, I want you to come now, because see how I just did it? I want you to get him to do it the same way. Okay. okay. Tell, is he getting it in the same place? Yeah. 
Okay, so now you're going to do the next part of the maneuver. Okay, snuggle in really close to her. Okay, and now you guys are going to be a penguin. Left, right, left, right. Okay, <laughs> sure. So you can walk, walk around. Okay, and you keep the pressure up. So you lift the uterus up. Okay, can you see, can you see how, is that good? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, it should be, shouldn't Talk it? Talk a little more okay. about the environment for creating oxytocin. You have a couple of things to help you in the end of pregnancy. Now, here's... Cervixes are really interesting, right? Because what they do is they protect, here's the baby again. With hair, there. Okay, so if this is the uterus, so this is the woman's legs here, right? And the cervix is still inside, right? Because the vagina is here, okay? So I want to tell you a little physiology that will make you understand and feel calmer about birth. The big question everybody has and comedians have so much fun with is how on earth does a head fit through, right? And everybody thinks, especially if they've had uncomfortable pap smears or uncomfortable vaginal exams and those things, they think, oh no, well, how's it going to be if I have, you know, an eight, 10 pound baby? And here's where amazing, amazing physiology comes in. Normally, your vagina feels pretty straight, feels more or less pretty straight, and you've got a lot of muscular control around it, right? But by the time you get to the end of pregnancy, what happens is that these kind of magical tissue formations that are called rugae, but you don't care what they're called, basically what they do is they allow your vagina to really function like an accordion, okay? So it basically creates these folds, and so you have the ability to expand phenomenally, temporarily, okay? So that's why you should, I see a couple people going, oh, thank you, phew. So um, it's really important, I know, because people have a lot of fear about that, you know? And, uh, and it's important to be able to visualize that you have this temporary adaptation that happens with the rugae around the vagina that allows for massive expansion and then later it changes and with the hormones changing it goes back again. It's much different, all right? So that's the vagina and then the cervix exists as the little gateway between your uterus and the outside world. Hi. So basically cervixes when you're not pregnant are like the consistency of your nose, okay? Like if you tap your cervix, it's like this. Okay? Once you get pregnant, already, right away, by the time you're a few weeks pregnant, by the time you're a few months pregnant, it's softened because of the effects of hormones and it feels, if you tap it, a little bit more, a little bit more like your lips. Okay? So it already starts that. But this is where you can have some impact. Okay? The idea is that you want, by the time you get to term, which is 37 to 42 weeks, to have a cervix which is as soft and favorable to labor as possible, right? It's what everyone wants. Now, m what most people in, in traditional agricultural or, um, or um, what do we call when people wander, you know, nomadic. nomadic, thank you. What they have that people don't have now is they don't sit in chairs all the time, okay? And they tend to carry things on their heads and they tend to squat a lot. All of those things are common to pretty much every culture, every historical group of people in the world. They walk a lot, they climb, they squat a lot, okay? All of those things you can see put pressure on the cervix, right? Only us sits on chairs, okay? And when you sit on a chair, right, just think about it. Imagine I'm at the airport in one of those embarrassing x-ray machines, all right? So when you sit like this, you don't have any weight on your cervix. You really have hardly any on your cervix. And most of us spend most of our time like this, right? It's a big problem. It's a problem because it definitely um, makes us a little less physiologically adapted. But the good news is you can fix it, okay? And here's how you can fix it. Basically, the first of all, the things that I showed you like this will, main, will make the baby's head tend to come down a little bit more sitting on the cervix. The other thing is to actually do a lot more exercise and walking, all right? And then the next one is sex. Sex is fabulous for people in the last trimester for a whole bunch of reasons, okay? 
Now, when they do research to say, will sex make me not go overdue? Will it make me come early? Usually they get inconclusive results or else they get one one way and then the next study goes up. And the reason is because it's impossible. I mean, what they do when they interview the people from those studies is they say, oh, we were in the group that was told not to have sex, but we did. And then the people who were in the group that was told to have sex go, well, we did, but we didn't, we were supposed to, but we didn't really, because we didn't feel like it, we were fighting that week. So first of all, it's really hard to control for that. Secondly, most of those studies don't say, what, five minutes? 10 minutes, an hour, what kind of sex, right? So what I want to show you mechanically is the ways that you can have some impact on making the cervix and your uterus more favorable for labor, okay? So first of all, the basics, walking, squatting if you do that, sitting and tailor sit as opposed to chairs, that kind of stuff. Um, but, but basically, the cervix is helped by mechanical stimulation and by hormonal stimulation. So what happens is that if you actually have people who are regularly having sex, you have movement of the cervix, okay? So the cervix, when it moves around, tends to get softer just by that, okay? The second thing is that when people actually have, have seen around the cervix, then what happens is it has, some, it has uh, something in it called prostaglandins. And prostaglandins tend to soften and to create contractions for people, all right? So other ways that people can do that, sometimes things like nipple stimulation can also be really good for people. Um, obviously, I'm not telling people they should have sex if they don't feel like having sex. But if people, like most of us, don't want to go overdue, would like to have a, a cervix that's as favorable as possible, it definitely makes sense to have as much sex as possible. There's no doubt about that. It definitely helps. And when there's ethnographic studies of people in really sex positive cultures where they tend to have sex almost every day, you have almost nobody who goes beyond 40 weeks. Almost nobody. So this is just really worth, uh, it's worth knowing. Okay. So um, everybody has questions about the mucus plug. The mucus plug I always think to myself, someone said to me the other day, oh, what do you do for a living? I said, oh, I just answer all the most embarrassing questions that everybody has, all the things they wonder but don't want to say. So look, inside the cervix, there's this genius little thing, which is a plug um, designed to stop any kind of infection from coming up here, OK? And what happens is you start to lose that plug at some point in the last few weeks of pregnancy. Some people lose it all at once. You know, they go to the toilet and they go, whoa, what's in the toilet, right? And they lose it, it's almost like a little tampon, okay? It can be a mix of colors. It could have dried blood on it. It could have fresh blood on it. It could have a bit of mucus, like yellow and green on it. Uh, it can just be whitish, whitish yellow and look almost like a little tampon. But more people actually lose it gradually, okay? So what happens is that most women in the last trimester will say that they feel like they have a lot more discharge, and especially after sex, that they're more likely to have a little bit. And what they're doing is sometimes losing bits of their mucus plug, all right? So there's no danger, there's no risk, it's completely fine. And even if it's got like a little bit of pink in it, it's, it's all fine, it's just all normal, okay? So, Let's look at a few of the issues and, and challenges of end of pregnancy. One of the ones that people talk about a lot are varicose veins, okay? And varicose veins, you have to remember, are 90% genetic. You can have people who gain enormous amounts of weight, who are really overweight, who never get varicose veins, people who are super athletic and slim and they get varicose veins. Varicose veins are things that are amenable to some extent by using support hose. It's a good thing to get some kind of a consultation and just follow them up and then you can get them treated. Whatever you do, just don't beat yourself up about it. There's nothing you could have done. <laughs> That's the most important thing. And sometimes people get scared because varicose veins don't just happen, here's your feet. Okay, so people think of their varicose veins sometimes being in their lower legs, occasionally behind their knees, once in a while here. But here's the big secret that freaks out lots of people. You can have something called vulval varicosities, okay? And they're actually pretty common because of the increased blood flow. So sometimes people could have these raised 
blood vessels that are anywhere around the perineum and the vulva. And really, it's the same thing as what you're experiencing with hemorrhoids, right? They're just expanded blood vessels in different parts of your body. So when we talk about the postpartum, we'll talk about what to do about those. But in the, pre in the prenatal period, the best thing you can do is get a consultation for the ones in your legs. Usually, you're going to get support hose, and you put them on first thing in the morning, and that will really help. Um, vulval varicosities, you're often going to put pressure packs like ice packs on. If they're aching or throbbing, get off your feet and always put some pressure, uh, um, pressure on them. And that's pretty much all you're going to do, OK? A lot of people wonder about exercise near the, la near the end of pregnancy. And they wonder, is it safe? Well, the answer is we really should be asking the opposite question, which is, why do we have such a sedentary society? Is that safe? And the answer is it isn't, actually. What we should all be doing, even in pregnancy, is walking probably close to eight to 10,000 steps a day, which is an hour to an hour and a half. For some people, that's what they do already. And for other people, they think, are you kidding me? That's huge, right? So um, I would say there's lots and lots of benefits to your circulation, to your cervix, to everything from walking. So if you're not already walking, make a point, whether you have to go indoors to it or whether you can do it, whether you're happy to go outdoors, you should try to get in about an hour of walking a day as long as you're a healthy, you know, normal person. And if you can't do it all at once, that's completely fine. Just break it up into, say, 10, 15-minute uh, walks. But there's, I won't go into all the benefits, but basically, we should have everybody walking. The more contentious things are heavy weight lifting. Um, you know, in the last couple of years, some people have done things like run marathons when they're 36 weeks. Anybody here thinking of doing that? And we don't have to deal with that? No, good. So I don't, I don't know that the evidence is great for that because of the jostling and the moving. But people who run marathons are just going to do it anyway. So you just leave them alone, really. But, um, and people who do weight lifting, here's the secret. Generally speaking, you're going to get a lot of benefits from weight lifting at any point, including pregnancy. And you're going to get benefits from the pressure on the cervix. The key thing is just to make sure you're not part of the tiny, tiny number of people who has a cervix that's tendent, that would tend to come open too early. And that's very easy to determine. If you're a person who has sex and then has hours and hours of contractions afterwards, you would definitely call your midwife and get them to check your cervix, obviously, right? Um, but the vast majority of people, you can do walking, you can do weightlifting, you can have tons of sex, and it's completely safe, and it's, and it's all good, right? It's all good. So in terms of safety, what's the single most important thing for the end of pregnancy? It's fetal movement, OK? You know, we have all these tests that we can do, right? None of them are as valuable as people being able to feel fetal movement. So that's the most, people are always worried, like, oh, should I be having more tests? Oh, should I, you know, have this? But the main thing is just feeling fetal movement every day. Okay? Never feel shy to call your midwife if you don't, if you think you don't have fetal movement. It's never a wasted call. Okay? That's the most important, that's, that's the single most important thing for safety. Okay. Oh, I didn't show you the back movement yet. There's something I want to just show you that's going to come up now as we move into labor that's very useful. And that's that, remember how I mentioned you have this nerve plexus around the front and in some people it goes around the back? Some people get back labor, and it can be really nasty. It's almost always the lower back, right? And can I just use you again for a sec? If you just lean on this for a sec. This is an area where, again, having a partner who has larger hands or strong hands can sometimes be better than anybody else in terms of helping you. If you're a person who has um, pain near the end of labor or near the end of pregnancy or especially in labor, all through your lower back, there's a few ways that you can deal with this, all right? I'm going to just show you a couple. I want you to push back against my hands. One is just to put your hands firmly, both of them, against this area here. Push back, right? And you should feel good, firm support, right? Yeah. It should feel good, basically, good support. OK, just stay there. So what are we doing here? Remember when I showed you the pelvis? This area that opens, this area that opens, there's a lot of nerves in those areas. If we compress them effectively, you don't get much pain. OK? And usually what happens that makes people not believe it is that they're afraid of hurting someone. So they go, how does that feel? And they go, get off my back. That really bothers me. So the trick is to be able to do it quite hard, OK? So I'm just going to show you how hard, right? It's lots of pressure, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's one. The other one is that you can find the specific spot it's hurting. and 
take a fist like this, okay? And then I'm not going to push hard on you because you don't have that pain. But usually it'll be here or here and sometimes in the middle. But wherever it is, what you're going to do is firmly push in like that, okay? And can you feel the support with that? Yeah. Yeah, it usually feels good anyway. And if you're in labor, this stuff can feel really, really helpful, okay? So just remember that. You're going to use your fist or the flat of your hands. Get your partner to push back against you. And you push hard, actually. That's the best way to describe it. Push hard because what you think, it's good. <laughs> Thank you. Um, because what you want to do is compress the nerves. And you have to push hard to compress nerves. That's why when people do these gentle things, for most people in labor, it's not that effective.